Hello everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the second screencast in our unit on the F-bomb, or more generally on swearing. In the previous screencast, I reviewed the social and legal backdrop for our discussion, which culminated in this interesting hypothesis from the FCC. Given the core meaning of the F-word, any use of that word or a variation in any context inherently has a sexual connotation. This is the FCC's connotations hypothesis, and in the U.S. context, it can be used to justify a lot of special legal restrictions on use of the F-word on public airwaves. And so part of what we want to do is amass evidence that's relevant to the FCC's claim here. And this screencast is devoted to facts that I think might be useful there. We're going to look at swears from the perspective of semantics and pragmatics and from the perspective of language acquisition and human language processing. Our first topic addresses the degree to which swears are integrated into the compositional system. So this is a SEMPRAG topic. Some people might have the intuition that swears are sort of separate from the language itself, or at least separable from it. And my goal here is to show you that that's just not the case. Swears are special, but special in ways that reveal that they're full-fledged linguistic items. Actually, one initial glimpse of that is the German example in one here. The word of interest is verdammtes, which means roughly damn. And the noteworthy thing is that this adjective takes the standard morphology of other attributive adjectives in German. So here it's modifying a noun with neuter gender in direct object position, so it gets this es suffix. So while this adjective may be verboten in some contexts, it's grammatically just an everyday adjective. Now, English doesn't have such adjectival morphology, but there are still things we can do in English to see that adjectival swears are really just adjectives. In 2, for example, I've noted that many adjectives can be used attributively, as in 2a, and also predicatively, as in 2b. But some adjectives are restricted to just the attributive form. For example, you can't say, the spy is former. Uh, other adjectives that are like this are like the road is main versus the main road, where the first one is just ungrammatical because main can't be used predicatively. And it turns out that adjectival swears fall into the same category as former and main. They can't be used predicatively. So you can say the damn dog is on the couch, but not the dog is damn. The case of bloody is interesting. This is a pretty strong swear in British English, but I think Americans know roughly how it works. And so you can say the bloody dog is on the couch and it's ambiguous between a swear reading and a gruesome one where the dog is covered in blood. In contrast, the dog is bloody has only the gruesome blood covered reading. And these contrasts extend to other predicational contexts like I consider the dog annoying. That's fine, but you can't consider the dog damn. You could consider the dog damned if you thought it was going to go to hell, but not just damn. For damn, it's just not clear what that would mean, I think. In five, I'm just providing some quick facts to show that there are grammatical patterns that only swears and swear-like things can participate in. My dearly departed colleague Ivan Sog used to use facts like this in his intro courses to help convince people that they had a lot of linguistic knowledge that was never taught to them in a classroom because... Surely none of you had a teacher in elementary school who explained that it's grammatical to say who the heck, but ungrammatical to say which student the heck, or that you can say why the heck, but not for what reason the heck. And by the way, this is completely general. If you can put a definite determiner on a swear, it'll probably show this same pattern. One intuition you might have about all these examples that this is that the swears aren't really acting as modifiers. It's more like they're doing something separate in terms of the meanings they contribute. And I think there's something to that intuition. So first, in six, we have the phrase, my damn toe. But this is nothing like my big toe or my sprained toe in terms of its meaning. The adjective damn is not modifying what's next to it in a compositional sense. It seems to do something much more general and ambient, like convey heightened emotion about the overall situation being described. And that seems like a compositional puzzle where the embedded modifier is just not acting like an embedded modifier. The facts in 7 and 8 make a similar point. We have these fixed, what I'll call balanced constructions, like water or no water in 7 and as sure as sure can be in 8. These are flexible about what the repeated phrase can be, but it has to be repeated exactly. No change of vocab, even where the terms are synonyms, and no unbalanced modifiers, as in things like water or no cold water, as in 7b, or as sure as extremely sure can be in 8d. 
but adjectival swears get a total pass here. You can say water or no friggin' water or as sure as friggin' sure can be. It's kind of like the balance construction just doesn't even see the swear. And this too makes it seem like the swear isn't contributing in a normal way, but rather doing something more complex at a quasi-pragmatic level. Finally, English has almost no infixing morphology. Unlike some other languages, English has prefixes and suffixes, but pretty much no infixes. The only major exceptions are expressive infixes like a uh, freaking adorable and abso freaking lutely. And here I've got a sample of these that I harvested from the Urban Dictionary, not because I believe these are actually in general use, but rather just to show that this is pretty productive and systematic. As far as I know, the only other infix in English is the Homeric infix of Homer Simpson's saxophone. So in a way, this is a place where swears again get some special treatment. To infix, you need to be some kind of swear. And so inserting something into this frame as an infix might actually coax it into a swear-like sense. And that's why it's so charming that my niece said, Jai really normous when she was about three years old. She had internalized the prosodic rules for infixing, but not the swearing component that the infix requires. And that's actually a nice transition into this second topic, productivity. The general observation here is that swears are pretty productive. You can coin new ones pretty easily. Now, they're unlikely to have any interesting taboos about them, unless you really work at it, but they'll still have the syntax and semantics of more established swears. The novel Motherless Brooklyn has the memorable line, if I wanted a gun, I'd get a gun, you diphthong. For the non-linguist, I should say that a diphthong is a sequence of two vowel sounds within a single syllable nucleus, but it might sound like a swear if you haven't heard it before. That's something about its shape as a word, as well as the syntactic frame that it's being used in in the example. This sticker is similar, what the fricative, uh, fricative is a type of phonological segment, but again, the word might sound like a swear here, and that's certainly stemming in part from the frame it's appearing in here, where what the X will make X sound like a swear for pretty much any choice of X. The original Robin of Batman and Robin was famous for coining swears in the context of the frame holy blank Batman, as in holy Toledo Batman or holy tintinabulations Batman. None of these are real swears, but they sort of get coerced into swears by the frame that Robin is using them in. And so all these facts are sort of providing you some templates for coining your own swears if you want, as I've indicated in 13. Have fun. Okay, let's start to move beyond forms to consider what swears contribute to the utterances they appear in. And to start, I thought it would be interesting to just directly confront the FCC's core connotations hypothesis about the F word. Now, I don't have a lot of proven methods myself for probing words for their connotations in general in a kind of open-minded way, but I think it's reasonable to hypothesize that for a focal word W, the words that occur with W in actual usage will reflect W's connotations, since connotations derive at least in large part from such consistent associations in usage. And natural language processing now makes extensive use of this kind of distributional idea for obtaining semantic representations for words and phrases in general. And so what I did is load in a large space of high dimensional numerical representations that were learned from massive quantities of free text by this Stanford team led by Jeff Pennington. These are the famous glove vectors. And what this table shows is the nearest neighbors by representational similarity for a selection of words that we can kind of use as controls and then test the F word. For example, the nearby words for speech include remarks, keynote, and address. For movie, we get film, Hollywood, and starring, as well as a lot of words that relate to film concepts. Okay, let's skip down here. For relief, which we discussed in the context of framing, we get words that do indeed engage with the frame elements for this word, as well as popular phrases that draw on that underlying frame. And finally, we get to our crucial comparison. For the word sex, we get the expected picture, which is a mix of words that refer to human sexuality as well as societal issues that surround sex and sexuality. And in light of all this, I think it's reasonable con to construe the FCC as saying that the frame for the F word will be very similar to the frame for sex. However, it's really not. 
The neighbors of the F word in our representational space are just other swears, along with some markers that might indicate informal language use and informal contexts. So, at least according to this method, the F word's connotations just aren't sexual. And I would say further that I feel that the burden is now on the FCC or its advocates to present some evidence for their connotational hypothesis, since I feel I have not found any such evidence myself, despite looking. I think our framework for diagnosing different kinds of meaning can help us get further insights into how swears work. So in 14, I've applied that framework to the item dam, beginning with the sentence, we need to do the dam laundry over the weekend. And I've put as the target meaning, the speaker is in a heightened emotional state. Now, that's very general, and I'm sure it's not sufficient to capture what dam actually does in an utterance of this sentence, but I, I think it's the best I can do. And I, indeed, I think the challenges of trying to explain what swears mean are actually really informative about how they actually work in the language. These, these challenges might run very deep. But let's set that aside. To start, we can try to cancel that target meaning, and that would be something like, we need to do the damn laundry over the weekend, but I'm not in a heightened emotional state. Hmm. It's hard to say what to make of that utterance. It, it seems consistent, albeit a bit odd stylistically, but I think the consistency just reflects how malleable damn is and how far our target meaning is from truly capturing whatever it's contributing here. So let's try to continue down the other branch of our flowchart. The first thing we can do is apply hypothesis N, and that would give a sentence like, we don't need to do the damn laundry over the weekend. Well, Whatever dam contributes here, it seems abundantly clear that this sentence can't be read as negating whatever dam is contributing. It's the same for hypothesis Q. The sentence, do we need to do the dam laundry over the weekend, just can't query the contribution of dam, right? It can't query anything about what the swear is plausibly doing in the sentence, however we phrase the target meaning. So both these tests indicate that the swear is not at issue in our terms. And then we ask, is it presupposed or conventionally implicated? That's our final test. And to probe it, our standard move is to try to do some backgrounding. And to do that here, I'm just going to use dam repeatedly in something like, oh, damn, we need to do the damn laundry over the damn weekend. This seems fine to me. And in particular, there's no evident redundancy stemming from the repeated use of the word dam. And that would seem to point to a classification of dam as presupposed. However, I'm concerned about that. I feel that damn and other swears can be used out of the blue to announce something about one's emotional state, and that doesn't feel like accommodation to me. Still, that feeling isn't hard evidence, but let me see if I can convince you that the presuppositional classification isn't correct by using some additional projection facts. So one thing we didn't get a chance to discuss for presuppositions is that they don't necessarily project through all semantic operators. We saw them go through negation, questions, and conditional antecedents. But attitude verbs like believe and say are often said to be able to plug presuppositions. And that's what we see in 15. In 15a, the speaker says, Jesse believes that Sam quit smoking. However, Jesse is deeply mistaken since Sam was never a smoker at all. And that sounds consistent. And that means that Sam used to smoke is not a speaker commitment, but rather only a commitment of the sentential subject here, Jesse. Example 15b can make the same point too. Jesse said that Sam used to smoke but quit. Here again, the speaker conveys no commitment to the presupposition. Now compare that with 16. Jesse said that we need to do the damn laundry over the weekend. There seems to be no possibility of displacement from the speaker onto Jesse for that swear. The speaker of the sentence is the one who swears and conveys heightened emotion, and we don't really learn whether Jesse did or didn't express such an attitude or have such an outburst. So what's really happening here? I actually think that talking about projection in the way we did for presuppositions might be misleading us in the context of swears. What I'd like to say instead is that each instance of a swear is an expressive speech act indicating heightened emotion at the moment of the act itself. So whoever actually utters the swear is the one who performs this act and repeated use is, of course, repeated performance of the act at different times, which is certainly meaningful. And I think we can further support this speech act analysis by considering that swears have a certain magic about them. 
where it really matters deeply that they are actually performed. And to see this, you might reflect on why people write things like what I've got in 17b and c here. What is the deal with these strategies, which seem determined to convey exactly what swear was used so that anyone can tell which one it was? It's kind of like nothing is hidden, and yet publications routinely print things like 17b and 17c, even where their policies prevent them from printing the full swear as in 17a. So why is this? Well, I think it's because the magic of swears derives from their performance, like you get with magic spells in fantasy novels. This observation from Scott Adams is mostly very perceptive about this. Adam writes, Naked, naughty words can destroy your brain and also society as a whole. However, and one would think this is obvious, it's completely safe to think naughty words, and it's safe to cause other people to think naughty words. But if you spell those naughty words without the asterisk loincloth to protect your victims, you're a danger to society. The insight here is that it's different to think the words than it is to say them aloud. And in our terms, it's different to truly perform the swearing act. And to do that, you have to actually intone them. And so 17b and the like just don't perform the acts, and so they're in some sense safe as a result. The magic spell is not uttered. Once we start thinking in terms of speech acts, we're also invited to think about perlocutionary effects. And I think this quotation from Steven Pinker is getting at something very real in this regard. Pinker writes, Thanks to the automatic nature of speech perception, a taboo word kidnaps our attention and forces us to consider its unpleasant connotations. That makes all of us vulnerable to a mental assault wherever we are in earshot of other speakers, as if we are strapped to a chair and could be given a punch or a shock at any time. Now, this seems frankly quite overwrought to me, but I like the idea. The idea is that swears do something to the listener. These are acts that have consequences that are automatic in some sense. And we can even quantify aspects of this a little bit. So Jay et al. report that expressives provoke more frequent skin conducence responses, which is a measure of emotional arousal, than do other words, even very emotional words. So as Pinker might say, they literally make your blood boil. That's quite an involuntary perlocutionary effect, quite striking. In a very mild way, swearing is action, the way punching someone on the arm is action, which is, again, pretty striking and points to some clear ways in which swears are very special pieces of language. And that's a nice transition point into our final topic for the screencast, which is swears in language acquisition and processing. First, Swearing begins in kids as early as one year old, though it takes much longer for kids to master the proper usage conditions. I suppose we saw that a little bit with my niece's Jai really enormous. And the bottom line here is that kids swear, and some of them swear a lot, and their swearing is initially not well aligned with social norms. This should not surprise us. Kids are smart, and they learn quickly that swearing is important in society, but the rules are very complex. So they swear, and they get strong reactions from adults, which might have its own inherent interest for them, and it also helps to teach them about what swears are like, and what they do, and why they're special. So, if you have small kids in your life, you should discourage them from swearing, even if you yourself think swears are a valuable aspect of communication, right? You have to teach them that swears have special value. A second piece of evidence, swearing and memory. The summary of this evidence is that swears are remembered better, and perhaps differently, than other kinds of language, even very emotional language. So, for example, I can probably make this the most memorable fucking moment in this entire unit and perhaps the entire course just by dropping an F-bomb. We remember swears better than anything else in language. That's the bottom line. Okay, and this final bit of evidence is sort of fun. Swearing can help you withstand pain, especially if you don't swear a lot in your life regularly. As this study reports, swearing increased pain tolerance, increased heart rate, and decreased perceived pain compared with not swearing. So they do these experiments by asking people to hold their hands in ice water for as long as they can, and the core finding is that people can do that for longer if they're allowed to swear while they're doing it. Some related research is reported in this excellent podcast episode from Every Little Thing, uh, bleep yeah, can cursing make you, make you stronger? 
To close this out, I've listed some suggestive evidence indicating that swears might be localized in different parts of the brain from the rest of language. This is fun evidence, but it's all based on very few patients, and it's kind of hard to reconcile some of it with all the morphosyntactic integration for swears that I showed you before, but it's still interesting to think about what all this evidence might mean. For now, though, I'll just wrap up. Our next and final screencast in the series will zoom back out to the broader social issues surrounding swears and swearing.